Welcome, everyone. This presentation is being interpreted in Spanish. If you'd like to hear that, click on the world icon at the bottom right of your screen to access that. And if you're on a phone, click on the three dots and choose your language. Hola, buenas noches. Esta grabación, este seminario está realizándose con traducción simultánea en español. Y si quieren hacerlo, pueden seleccionar un globo, un icono que hay debajo en su pantalla. Ahí selecciona el idioma de preferencia. O si está en su celular, hay tres puntitos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Corby. Gracias, Mariana. And welcome, everyone, to Raptors in the Skies with Larry Broderick. And this presentation is scheduled for about an hour tonight, which will be followed by about 30 minutes of question and answers. And you can submit your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session after the presentation. If you're not familiar with Sonoma Land Trust, we are a local nonprofit that protects Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. And we've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 58,000 acres in our county so far. And we accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you who are out there helping us protect beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. And as we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. And we honor their knowledge, care, and stewardship of this special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land. Well, I'm pleased to present Larry Broderick. He's a good friend of mine and um, known him for a long time. And he is a Barrier, Bay Area Birds of Prey natural history and interpretive specialist who spent time with the Bird Rescue Center as a raptor handler and educational outreach volunteer. He founded the Jenner Headlands Hawk Watch and he's a certified UC California naturalist. He's also the recipient of the Madrone Autobahn's Betty Burridge Award and Sonoma Land Trust Special Recognition of Volunteer Service Award. He's been working with Birds of Prey as an educational specialist for over 25 years. And for the last 15 years, he's led walks, hikes, and presentations like this one with Solano and Sonoma Land Trust, Madrone Autobahn, the Bird Rescue Center, the Wildlands Conservancy, and the Redwoods Regional Ornithological Society, as well as many regional Autobahn chapters. Larry has conducted bird and wildlife surveys for the Wildlands Conservancy, Sonoma Land Trust, Solano Land Trust, and Pepperwood Preserve. He also assists dozens of docents, photographers, and tour guides in the course of his work. So Larry, welcome to the presentation tonight and thank you for hosting. Thanks, Corby. That That's a lot. <laughs> um, Anyways, welcome. So um, you all can hear me and it's a go. Sounding good. All right, everybody. Welcome to um, to this presentation. And, and thank you, Corby, for the introduction. And thank you, Sonoma Land Trust, for, um, for letting us provide this webinar tonight. Um, and thank you for letting us get out on the lands for the last 15 years or so. A lot of good trips we've had. Um, this is part of my three-pronged approach to, to raptor identification and natural history is the field study, the classroom study, and then the, the book study. So this is the classroom segment of that three-pronged approach that Jerry Ligori, Monty Curvin, Peter Levesque all kind of taught me, not just going out in the field, but looking in the books, and also going into classrooms. Lately, there's not as much classrooms and a lot more um, Zooms and WebExes. Anyways, with, with no without further ado, we'll um, we'll get into the program. Um, the Jenner Headlands Preserve is a wonderful place to watch birds of prey. Um, Sonoma Land Trust um, acquired it and then handed it over to the Wildlands Conservancy both agencies I work very closely with. 
under the loose organization of West County Hawk Watch, which are basically um, co-environmentalists, birders, hawk watchers, photographers, and naturalists. Um, we're very lucky to have the Jenner Headlands Preserve and um, the ability to watch birds of prey um, go through that pristine coastal prairie habitat. Um, again, Wildlands Conservancy Management and Access, originally implemented by Sonoma Land Trust with other agencies involved, Madrone Audubon, Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, Redwood Regional Ornithological Society, and the North Bay Birds Group. Um, we all started the Hawk Watch up in Jenner. Talking about hawk watches and, and migration, generally every fall, birds move from the north to the south. Of course, it freezes and gets cold up in uh, the Arctic Circle in Canada and Alaska. So we have all these movements of birds from the north to the south. And we're right over here in the um, Pacific Oceanic Route, Pacific Coast Route. It's the Pacific Flyway, but at Jenner, we're pretty much the, the coastal Pacific Flyway route. Um, birds of prey for me, um, they're important because a healthy population of, of birds of prey um, in the wild serves as a barometer for our ecosystem and the, and the balance of nature being predators at the top of the food chain, they serve as crucial indicators of health of our environment. It's kind of cliche, but back in the day, they had the canaries in the coal mine. And when the canaries would pass, the air was bad. Hence, more recently, DDT in the, you know, after the World War II in the 40s, 50s, and 60s accumulated. And Rachel Carl Carlson and Silent Spring, we realized, you know, by the, the 60s and 70s, we needed to do stuff and get going with uh, the ban on the DDT. Um, so that's when a lot more environmental law came into play. And once again, the birds of prey were at the forefront of, of uh, noticing cumulative DDT concentrations that were affecting their reproductive abilities. <clears throat> um. Researching the population trends of raptors provides a cost-effective in a way of de to detect environmental change, which allows us to take um, conser conservation action driven by the latest scientific data. Um, birds of prey on the top of the food chain. And of course, as contamin contaminants cycle through the prey base, they compound with the, the predators eating those, those prey items. Um, again, just the, the raptors playing the important ecological role by controlling populations of rodents and other small mammals. Hence, you know, the, 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 map, the prey base is controlled by these predators. If a certain prey species overruns the ecosystem, plants, seeds, insects supply, ecosystems can potentially collapse. The raptors help keep this all in balance. Um, you know, birds of prey for me are are a great way to um to engage the public in regards to further environmental outreach, education, and land preservation. Um, birds of prey are the most obvious predators we see. I mean, of course, some well schooled naturalists see mountain lions and bobcats. Um, you know, bears, but for the most part, we can see raptors every day if we just know where to look for them. And just a side note, <clears throat> there's a lot of photos in this program. Some are from the photographers in our collective group. Um, some are internet photos with permission and some are without, yet all photos are used for education and nonprofit use only here within the program all copyrights and credits to original photographers and entities 
stand. So, you know, people always say, why is Jenner such a hot spot? And <clears throat> excuse me, why is um why are there so many birds coming through the Jenner headlands every fall? Well, if you think about it, the coastal prairie um provides the updraft, and then the inland hills provide the thermals. So right there, this slide pretty much tells you the updraft from the coast and the thermals from the coastal hills provide like an elevator for the birds to gain altitude to carry on to their southerly route. Lots of times there's enough wind, so they don't even really need to use those updrafts because they're just riding the draft down the coast. So thermals and updrafts provide lift. The coastal northwest breeze um, provides basically a, a, a highway in the sky for these birds to travel south every every fall. These are some of the hawk watch groups. Um, this is an early slide. Can you guys see my cursor? So this is an early slide. Um, some of these folks are no longer with us. It's been, we're going on 15 years. A couple of these leaders have passed. This is about 10 years ago. Uh, this is more recent, one of Dave Barry's Wednesday teams. Dave Barry draws a big crowd on Wednesdays. And then this is uh, one year, Miles and Teresa were leading a team. And I think this is Lisa Hug. Um, so we have a lot of different teams out there on the hill at any given day. And we've been collecting data for about 15 years. The, the thing about this program um, is Western North American raptors. I really focus on birds in the West. Um, I don't get sidetracked by, by, by birds on the East Coast, raptors. They're great, but it's just for teaching, I'm focused on Western North American raptors. Um, and then of course, the best, the best way to learn birds of prey is learn the genus and then learn the species within those genus. So the genus of course is raptors. And then within the raptors um, is the occipiters, the falcons, the harriers, the kite, actually the harrier, the kite, the budios, eagles, osprey, and, and vultures. I say kites because there's other kites on the East Coast in, 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 the, in the middle America, um, but we're not going to go into the Mississippi or the snail kite, whatever, because we're not seeing those kites. We only see the white-tailed kite out here. So just focus on one kite, one. Um, vultures, there's a black vulture. You know, I should modify this program to start to include the um, the condors, but right now I'm just focused on the turkey vultures. We're still rebuilding the population of condors. But there's two exhibitors, coopers and sharp shinned. There is a goshawk, but we don't see them a lot. So I just focus on two, two exhibitors, coopers and coopers and sharp shin, falcons, peregrine, prairie, merlin, kestrel. Of course, there's a couple other falcons, but we don't see them on the hawk watch. One North American Harrier, really easy. One white-tailed kite, one kite this side of the Rockies. The tricky one is bootios. There's a lot of, of, of bootios. And, and when we get into the program more, we'll elaborate on that. Two eagles, bald and golden, one osprey, one vulture. This side of the Rockies for the most part. So it's really easy. One harrier, one kite, one osprey, two eagles, two exhibitors. The tricky thing is the falcons and the bootios, and of course, telling those two exhibitors apart, the coop, coopers from the sharp shin. That was a mouthful. Um, hence, um, sharp shin, or sharp shin hawks, there's smaller woodland hawks, um, exhibitors in general, smaller woodland hawks. Um, they, they're riparian corridors in the woods, sometimes in the open, but more often than not under the cover of the, um, of the oak forests, um, quick wing beats, um, and for the most part, um, short 
rounded wings and long tails. Um, this is a Cooper's Hawk. Um, and for the most part, oh, this is an adult, but for the most part, it has this Romanesque nose. The nose transitions from the from the, the beak to the forehead in one nice smooth transition, aka the Roman nose. Um, overall, adults are a, a orangish red um, with, with barring. And the back is kind of a sooty, a sooty gray, a sooty brown, and then uh, uh, pretty bold uh, tail barring on this adult Cooper's hawk. In flight, um, what we talk about is the rounded tail, and the head is well past the wrist. I get a lot of questions. <clears throat> excuse me. What? What? Where's the wrist? Well, on the birds wings also kind of like our arms this is where the wrist would be or where the wrist is and the head is well past that wrist so you just draw a line right there and the bird's head is past the wrist or the leading edge of the wing it's a juvenile bird yellow eye ken wilson photography um even when the bird's got its wings somewhat tucked in, the head is still well past the wrist. Cooper's hawk. And then a, a nice, long, somewhat rounded tail. It's tricky at times because the tail doesn't always look rounded, so don't be tricked by that. But it's definitely graduated tail feathers, long tail, finely streaked breast and chest. And again, the head is well past the wrist. If you take a line, and draw it across there, the bird's head is well past the wrist. Uh, juvenile Cooper's hawk. Um, just checking the, the verbiage here. Pretty much the same thing I, I had said. Um, and then again, perched up in the tree, it's the the the, the streaking is a is a fine teardrop style streaking on a cooper's hawk where on a sharp shinned hawk it's a bit more messy it's not as, as nicely defined as this cooper's hawk's fine teardrop breast streaking as opposed to a sharp shins hawk's messy streaking then on the, on the head it's got that roman nose the transition from the the beak to the sear to the forehead it's all nice, and, and we call it a Roman nose, a nice transition. On a sharp shin, it's more parakeet-like bill with a less of a transition there. The eyes somewhat forward on the head. On a sharp shin, it would be more centered. Small eye, small forward eye on a big head is Cooper's. Big googly eye centered on a small head is sharp shinned. So a little bit of the squaring off of the um, the head or a sharp shin is more rounded. A Cooper's is a bit more flat or squared off. I got another slide that'll show you that better. Okay, I'm sorry I keep I keep repeating it, but that's this is what my teachers taught me is head past wrist. Here's the wrist. Here's the head. Head past wrist, and rounded tail. tricky because this one's the tail's a little bit more fanned out and people do get confused because the angle here is perfect here's here's the wing loading and here's the head well past the angle's tricky here because the bird's kind of got its wing swept forward but you got to kind of take the line this way or take the line this way based upon how the wings are config configured but for the most part the head is well past the wrist and the head is well past the wrist the tail's found that fanned out but still rounded Oh, I'm going to slow down, just make sure interpreter's caught up. <laughs> um, gosh, what do we got here? This is an old fish and wildlife. This fish and game slide, now fish and wildlife. But um, I like these old slides because it's what the fish and game use to train their wardens. So um, a lot of these slides come from a program that I acquired from Solana Land Trust, where these are official 
well, not official. They're um, fish and wildlife, actually fishing game slides from back in the day. Um, juvenile bird, pretty heavily barred tail. Um, gray bars are a little bit thicker than the black bars. Um, tails gray and black. Birds overall two-tone with a brown and tan. Pretty finely streaked chest and the yellow eye. He's got his hackles raised. Hackles are the feathers on the back of the head, but again, squared off head, juvenile. And here's an adult, um, more orangish red, orangish barring. Um, and here's the thing, juvenile streaked, adult barred. So then look at those feet. Those are some of the, the biggest, most robust feet I've seen on an exhibitor. Uh, Cooper's hawk. Also with the coop, um, the, the nape of the neck isn't dark. And on a sharp shin adult, it would be. I'm telling you a lot. Take away a little. Take away what you can. A lot of people watch this program multiple times. And every time they see it, they learn something new. So don't feel like you got to learn everything at once. It's a lot. That was the Cooper's Hawk. This is the sharp shin, a rounded head, big centered googly eye, um, adult bird, squared off tail. Well, what, what do you mean squared off? Well, it's not graduated tail feathers and it's somewhat straight across the base. Um, pencil like legs, sharp shinned hawk, let's go figure. So um, very thin legs and hardware talons, um, bit of a rounded head. Um, Adult birds have uh, orangish barring. And then again, they like to hang out at the bird feeder. Juvenile bird gives you a bit of an idea of how small they are. Um, Two-tone, you know, tan and brown. A big bug-eyed um, eye in the center of the head. And then tail barring, dark with um, with brown, dark at I'd say off black and, and brown barring. This bird has been through a lot. These birds chase birds through thickets and brush. And you could tell the feather wear here that this bird has done its time um, following birds into um, dense, dense brush. This is kind of where you get the wristy effect of a, of a, of a sharp shinned hawk. His head's past the wrist, but not by much. This is a wristy look. I have somebody ask me, I haven't answered them on a on a message that said, what does wristy mean? Wristy just means that the head of the bird doesn't get past the wrist. So here's the wrists up forward to the head and the head is just past it. So this is a wristy look on a, um, on a sharp shin hawk, big centered googly eye. The transition from the beak to the forehead isn't as, um, isn't the same as a Cooper's Hawk, a bit of a parakeet style bill. And the transition from the bill to the forehead isn't as smooth as per se it was on the coop. People say rounded tail, but for the most part, the tail feathers are rounded, but the tail overall looks straight. So a straight tail, wristy effect, wristy. The bird's head barely gets past the wrist, if at all. Big centered googly eye, eyes yellow, juvenile bird this is an adult bird um black or dark nape on the neck um the again the, the orangish barring um tail if this tail was 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 folded in it would be nice and straight across so when the tail's fanned out it still looks straight not a lot of curvature to that tail the tail's not curved as it would be on the coopers um, um larry can you hear yeah. me yes um, we've got a couple people on the chat who are saying they can't see the slides. So I'm wondering if there are others out there that can, in fact, see the slides. If you could just confirm that in the chat, and then we could figure out if it's just how do I how do I get rid of the bar on top? The the um it's that the whole mute stop video participants that bar has been been there the whole time. Um, I guess that's okay. 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 I I see a, lot, a lot of people in the chat are saying they can see the slides. So I'll work with the people who cannot and we'll see. If and we then can. again, just for, for common knowledge, I think this thing's going to be posted on the SLT webpage too. So, so I think it'll, we're, we're recording it and it'll be up on YouTube. Okay.
Great. All right. Um, Thanks, Larry. You can continue. All right. Let me see where I was here. Um, oh, geez. Okay. So, so um, it's a, it's a small woodland um, exhibitor. It's almost as big as a J. I'm sorry. It's a little bit bigger than a J. Um, you know, again, the wrists are right up here in the front and the head barely gets past those wrists. So this bird is somewhat wristy. Um, a big centered eye, round head, lacking the Roman nose. Um, this bird is transitioning from a juvenile plumage to adult. You can see it kind of going from brown and tan to a bit of a, a, a reddish orange hue like the adult has here. But again, a rounded head, a centered big eye, the, the lack of the transition from the, the beak to the forehead, small spindly legs. On This is a juvenile. On an adult, it has that, that dark nape that, that goes down the back of the neck and the red eye, and then the overall orangish um, barring. This is a really interesting slide. I mean, that's a really squared off tail. Um, and again, this bird is wristy. This is a, um, a sharp shin hawk. This is a Cooper's hawk. Um, nice straight tail. The head barely gets past the wrists. On the coop, the head is well past the wrist. This is the wrist. And you gotta think that these wings are pushed forward, but the wrist is actually here. So the line is, goes this way instead of this way. Um, and of course the tail is fanned out, but it's rounded. This is where it gets kind of tricky, um, perched up, but you can really see the forward eye and the squared off head on the coop and the somewhat centered eye and the rounded head on the sharp. The sharp shin has the dark nape. The Cooper's hawk does not. Um, you don't see the transition as well here with the sharp, but you can for sure see that Roman nose effect on the coop. Coop has the rounded tail. For the most part, the sharp has a square tail. This sharpie has a notch tail. And a lot of people will say like, well, only the sharp shin has a notch tail. But I've seen coopers with notch tails. So I don't really use the notch tail. I just go straight across versus rounded. This is a kind of a busy slide, but um, this coop head is well past the wrist. This sharp is, is more wristy, uh, more of a squared off tail, somewhat rounded tail. This sharp shin has a, a big uh, googly eye. The coopers has more of a, a, a forward smaller eye. The sharp shin's tail is squared off and the coops is rounded. Um, here you can see the graduation in the in the tail feathers. They're they're stacked on top of each other on a coopers. And on a sharp shin, they're 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 not graduated, they're not stacked on top of each other, and they're squared, they're they're they come to a, a straight edge. The coopers comes to a rounded edge, the feathers are stacked on top of each other, aka graduated. This, this is a good photo because it shows the Cooper's Hawk's head past the wrist. And see, there's the notch tail. So I just, it, it, it boggles my mind when people say that a, a sharp shin hawk has a notch tail. Well, right here, the Cooper's Hawk has a notch tail. That's why I don't use it. But for those who do, more power to you. Um, rounded tail minus the notch, head past wrist. This bird's more wristy, head barely gets past the wrist, and then a squared off tail. Sharp shin, coopers. There's that big somewhat centered eye in, in the round head. And there's the little notch in the, in the transition from the beak to the sear to the forehead. And on the coop, it's nice. It just, there's no, there's no, it's just one transition. It's, it doesn't, it's one slope. They call it a Roman nose or the transition from the beak to the sear to the forehead is smooth. Here, there's a bit of a notch. 
and a sharp uh the squared off head um rounded head forward eye centered eye okay we're almost done with uh the occipiter uh portion this is the one bird that's not a cooper or a sharp shin it's a it's a goshawk and um the tail feather is wavy the bars and the and the tail feathers um aren't straight across it's wavy and the bird's more heavily marked up and the underwing coverts in the body the juvenile uh goshawk it's the third occipiter and i kind of threw a curveball i only said i was going to talk about two coops and sharps but i i threw in a goss just a goshawk just for comparison goshawk's a lot bigger We've seen a couple of them at Jenner, seen a couple of them at Golden Gate Raptor Observatory. Uh, they're almost, they're about as big as a red tail, but it's an occipiter. That's it. That's the hard part. And that's the, um, the occipiters. Um, so from here on out, it's, it's relatively easier because the species are, look a lot different than each other. The Cooper's and Sharp Shin is the toughest thing we do in raptor identification for me on the West Coast. Um, falcons are small. Or there's two There's two large falcons and two small falcons. For the most part, they have long pointy wings and a long tail and a blocky head. The two small ones are the Kestrel and the Merlin. We all know the Kestrel because we see them almost every day. Um, they're often along the roadside, highways, um, freeways. Um, and for the most part, the female has a finely barred tail and a somewhat two-tone, and the male has a a, a red a, a brick red tail with uh, often with barred um, feathers on the edges of the tail, and then a black uh, subterminal um, on the tail. So the reason I threw a Merlin in here as well is because that's what I get a lot of confusion on is people tell me they see a Merlin and it's a Kestrel or people tell me they see a Kestrel and it's a Merlin. The main thing with these small falcons, the Kestrels look nothing like a Merlin in regards to its tail. They're, they're all the same size, but the Merlin's generally darker and the tail barring on a Merlin is vastly different than the tail barring, barring on a female kestrel or a male kestrel. So just that's what I do most of the time is when I'm checking small falcons, I'm looking at the tail to determine if it's a Merlin or not. Also the Merlins are only here in the late fall and through the winter. So we get our kesses year round with an influx in the fall and winter. And then we get our Merlins only overwintering, say, mm, late, say, say, uh, late S September through uh through the, the spring, or, or, or till till the end of winter. So just take a snapshot in your head. American kestrel, strong facial markings. Again, really strong facial markings, very colorful. And then, um, oh, I didn't even know the slide was in here. Wow. Um, here's the under, underside of a female Kess and a male Kess. And again, there's the detail on the male's tail. These outer tail feathers are striped. The um, the bulk of the tail is is a brick red. And it's got that heavy, dark subterminal, then a translucent terminal. So this is the male. This is the female. Male tail. Male, American kestrel tail, female, American kestrel tail, and then compare that to the Merlin's tail. Um, also, the Merlin is a, is a bit more just is two tone, um, and it has a faint mustache and a bit of a eye superciliary eye line. Um, Eye line and unique tail barring compared to the kestrel. It's all you really need to do. Two small falcons, American kestrel and Merlin, two big falcons, prairie and peregrine. 
And as long as you can tell the small from the big, that's half the battle. And then you just go to work on whether it's a Merlin or a Kestrel. Uh, again, Merlin with unique tail barring, long pointy wings, long tail, blocky head, heavily streaked. Um, and then again, there's that shot with the uh, the the faint mustache, the eye, the eye, the superciliary eye eye line, uh, the 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 streaked marked up um, chest, and then the fine white bars on a black tail for the most part. So just take a, a look at that tail and you go Merlin and you compare that tail to what the Kestrel's tails look like. And that's pretty much half the battle in identifying small falcons in Western North America. The prairie falcon is just a lot bigger, it's about the size of a peregrine. And um, it is tricky because it does look like a Merlin, but it's just a lot bigger. So that's why I always talk about the four falcons we talk about on the West Coast, the Merlin, the Kestrel, the Prairie, and the Peregrine. The main thing with the, the Prairie is um, it's a good-sized falcon, and it has, again, a superciliary eye, eye line, um, a, a mallard or a mustache, and it's overall two-tone tan and brown, a sandy, a sandy brown back and a buffy tan front and it's streaked. That's perched. In flight, what we look at is these things called wing pits. So it's like your armpit, but it's a wing pit. The technical term is uh, axillary. Um, and it's basically, we when we see it in the field, we look for wing pits. So we got this, this, this tan bird. Um, we're looking for the eye line, the mustache, and then the wing pits on a prairie falcon in flight. Peregrine, overall uh, slate blue-gray back, um, kind of a buff colored chest and, and uh, belly with uh, fine barring. And then it's kind of, it's helmeted. It kind of looks like a helmet with uh, this big mallard stripe on its, uh, on its cheeks. The, the biggest thing we, we str I struggle with in the field when I, when I, I usually it's a peregrine, but when I'm in prairie falcon country, I want to make sure that I'm calling the right thing. So typically what I do is on a peregrine, I look for the big, thick mallard stripe and on a prairie, the small, thinner mallard or mustache. That's just the head stuff. With the wing pits, even though this peregrine has a shadow, it's still got barring on the feathers on the underwing coverts. The prairie, the feathers are solid. So I kind of trick photography. These are the wing pits or the axillaries on a prairie. On a peregrine, even when it's shadowed, it's still got cross hatching or cross, the, the feathers are still barred. So peregrine, prairie, both relatively the same size. This is more of a water. The peregrine is more of a water, city, bridge, skyscraper, canyon type of predator. The prairie falcons we typically see in the high plains and in the deserts and the sage and the uplands, um, more, more inland. A juvenile peregrine. Um, uh, this is an interesting slide. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a northern harrier. The harrier was bugging the peregrine. And it got to the point where um, the peregrine just decided to eat the harrier for lunch. Is a juvenile peregrine. They're a bit more, the, the, the buff color or the tan is a bit more orangish hue to it on this specific race. But again, the strong mallard or mustache. And then um, the bird will acquire its slate blue-gray back and its buffy underparts. A juvenile has a bit of a, a rufous hue to it. Okay, uh, we've done exhibitors and falcons. Harrier. Um, Harriers, old school name, Marsh Hawk, new school, Northern Harrier. Um, they have a very distinctive owl-like facial disc. Um, they 
can they usually are flying low to the ground and they hear their prey more than they do see it. I mean, they do see it, but a lot of their hunting mechanisms is because of that owl-like facial disc. And that's why they're always flying low to the ground, coursing and turning and, and hovering um, along the ground and, and brushy grasses. You can see the, um, the owl-like facial disc on this slide. Um, somewhat um, pointy wings, long tail, long winged and an owl-like facial disc. Um, that's, this is what the one of the birds in, on our Western North American raptors. There's only one North American harrier. So it's really, I, I'm not gonna say it's easy because some people struggle, but when we're talking about a genus, um, there's only one North American harrier. So it, you can get them mixed up with other birds of prey, but it's pretty unique in, in eventually you'll you'll learn to call the harriers right off the bat because they are so unique part of that uniqueness is the owl like facial disc the white rump patch of course the male is gray um the female is brown brown and tan and the juveniles are um are a cinnamon pumpkin uh hue Often they fly with a dihedral. I get that question all the time. What's a dihedral? It's a shallow V. So turkey vultures also are um, famous for a dihedral. Sometimes you'll get it on a Swanson's hawk. Here's a male northern harrier. Mm, not sure if this is female or juvenile. Um, long, narrow wings. Um, strong dihedral. Courses low over marshes and fields. Highly crepuscular is dawn and dusk. Crepuscular is dawn and dusk. So here's a slide that better. I, that's why I couldn't really get a good read on this bird. I mean, it looks more juvenile because it's not streaked. But I threw this slide in here because it helps with determining a female from a juve. Male, female, juvenile. Well, Larry, what's going on with these two? This one's more pumpkin cinnamon, pumpkin colored cinnamon. Um, and the female is more um, marked up patagials or front or leading edge of the wing and a marked up uh, chest and belly. So streaked here and streaked here, female, not streaked, juvenile. That's typically what we see, shallow dihedral no head projection, long tail, bold rump patch. So we're, we've gone through occipiters, falcons, harriers, and kites, carrier and kite. Kite's pretty unique. I mean, I don't lump it into the falcon family because it's a kite, but it does have a long tail and long pointy wings. So it's got a similar form. It's just more lofty and buoyant um, in, in its flight mannerisms, but um, often seen hovering and, and kiting down to its prey. Um, White-tailed kite, old school, black-shouldered kite. Um, prey, exchange, prey exchange is a big part of their courtship with birds of prey. A uh, male will catch something and deliver it to the female to show that he's a, a good producer and um, can supply the nest when when eggs are being uh, laid and, 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 and chicks being hatched. Um, long pointy wings, long tail, overall, from the, the, the ventral, overall white and gray effect with black carpels. But um, from the, the, the dorsal side, you got this overall gray appearance with these black shoulders. But remember, it's not the black-shouldered kite anymore. It's the white-tailed kite. That had to do with the name change because there was another kite somewhere else that was similar that had the name. They're always changing names. It's quite a struggle to keep up with the constant name changing of our diurnal birds of prey. Let me see what else that says there. Um, see, it does say falcon shape. Um, white tail, black carpels, they, they hover. 
There was a time when they were down to 70 pairs, um, but we brought them back due to land acquisition, preservation, and habitat restoration, which is exactly what Sonoma Land Trust does. And that's why I'm such a fan of these groups that preserve land for habitat for wildlife, because the only way we're going to keep the wildlife we have is if we have land that provides for those those species of wildlife we're talking about. Okay, here's the big one. So time-wise, we're getting close there. This thing goes till the, the, the PowerPoint was scheduled to eight, probably go to 8.10, and then questions after 8.10. The Budio is the hardest one to, to teach because we have so many Budios in Western United States. Um, and I'm going to go over six right now. Kind of go fast, but remember this presentation will be up on a, a YouTube channel and through Sonoma Land Trust. And you can always reach out to me with questions. I have my email at the end of the, the presentation. Budios are large soaring hawks, long wings, somewhat broad, rounded wings with shorter tails. You know, the exhibitors, the falcons, the kite, the harrier, everything we've talked about is is long-tailed. The Budios have a bit of a shorter tail in relation to their body size. red tail hawk is the one we see um, all the time. Uh, the most uh, successful Western Budio in sheer numbers and color schemes in regards to morphs, light morph, dark morph, um, Western, um, Harlands, a lot of different uh, subspecies of uh, red tails. Um, it's just the most, I, I would say it's the most opportunistic and hence the most successful bird of prey for me in the West. I mean, um, I, I, pound for pound, I don't know of any other bird of prey that does as well as the red tail in terms of numbers. Um, and again, in our Western, in our area, Sonoma County, uh, North Bay, this is the Patagio. Um, it's a, a wing bar and it's the leading edge of the wing and it's dark. And it's one of the main things we look for when identifying red tail hawks, a dark leading edge of the wing, AKA um, potential bar. It's got a dark hood, got a belly band, got a dark leading edge of the wing. And then it's got a brick red tail with a fine dark subterminal. Um, juvenile birds, tricky because you lose your red tail. That's why I don't always talk about the tail. I talk about the belly band, the dark hood, the patagial. Because on a juvenile bird, you got the dark hood, you got the belly band, you got the patagial. Dark hood, belly band, patagial. The, the, the thing on the juvenile bird is um, the tail barring is a finely barred uh brown bars over a overall over a overall tan tail busy slide but this program will be available for you later adult adult juvenile 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 what i'm getting at is belly band hood patagial belly band hood patagial can't really see the potential here, but you can see the finely barred tail. You're always going to get that brick red tail on an adult. On a juvenile red tail hawk, you look for the, the way this tail is banded and the increments that the brown bands overlay on the tan overall base. You can see it here in flight. There it is close up when it's perched. Juvenile red tail hawk every time. <laughs> when 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 you got dark morph red tails, it's really really hard because a rough legged or a ferruginous dark morph will look similar body and leading edge of the wing, but the tail on a dark morph red tail is going to be red if it's adult or finely barred if it's a a juvenile. So this is a juvenile red tail hawk. If this was a ferruginous or 
a rough legged hawk, the bird we, we compare this bird to, the tail barring would be different. That was red tail hawk. This is the rough legged hawk. Um, this is a juvenile, a sooty uh, terminal, and then a, a, a white um, base, tail base. A lot of things going on with them um, with rough legged hawks in terms of colors and, and where things are. That red tail hawk we had earlier, um, for the most part, this bird's here year round. Its numbers increase in the fall and winter. With rough legged hawks, we typically get them in um, uh, late October, November, um, and then they stay through the winter, but we get very few. We had like four or five last year in the region. Some years we get 10 or 12. Um, up at Klamath, we'll get like 40 or 50 or 100 a day on, on certain days in Klamath when there's water in the basin. Just depends if there's water up there. But this is a really unique bird. Some It's one of my favorite birds. Um, it's got these, where the red tail hawk had a patagial bar, the rough legged hawk has a carpal block. Carpal block. Um, I think that arrow is supposed to go to the carpal block. So disregard that arrow. Um, overall white tail base and either one or multiple black subterminal bars, but overall unmarked patagial um, and then carpal blocks. The bird that this is an adult, the 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 juvenile birds are tricky because there's not a lot going on in the in the the body and the chest. But you can, I mean, there's a lot going on, but it's hard to tell them apart. But you can get the carpal block and the somewhat unmarked patagial, then the white tail base and the dark um, terminal on the tail. Terminal is end. Um, lots of different looks. This is kind of the look we get a lot is a sooty tail bar, which is a juvenile. Um, a, a, a single bar, I think is, I got a slide come up that talks about single bars versus multiple bars. But this is an adult dark morph. You still see the carpal blocks, even though the bird's dark. But the tail is what we base, what I base the call off of is the white base and overall white tail with the dark um, subterminal. Um, again, here are carpal blocks. Potagial is marked up, but it's not solid. Potagial is the leading edge of the wing. This bird, again, probably juvenile, sooty tail base white sooty tail terminal, white tail base, carpal block, carpal block, unmarked potagial. Kind of a bird just in flight, Rick Rick Ivets, um, the carpal block, the unmarked potagial, the white base, the, the sooty dark terminal. And this bird has legs feathered to the toe. The only other birds that have legs feathered to the toe are golden eagle and ferruginous. Here's the thing on the, the 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 tail bars on the adults. It's um it's it I've done a lot of study on this. Uh adult female has a white tail with a with a defined blackish distal. Males show multiple tail bands. So this would be a male because there's multiple tail bands. But this is Jerry Liguori talking in some of the rough-legged hawk study um, groups. Overlap occurs in sexes. Some birds may not safely be assigned, which basically says, you know, the, the only way you're going to be able to tell some birds is by having them in the hand and, 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 and sexing them via banding and uh, identification skills. So even though... This bird looks like a male. It might not be. It's just very, it's very tricky. So I always just go adult. I keep it safe and just go, you know, adult, juvenile, juvenile, adult, probably juvenile, juvenile. I'm not that far along to be able to tell male from female. Ferruginous hawk. We did red tail. We did rough legged. Ferruginous hawk, another winter migrant, comes down a little bit earlier earlier than the rough-legged. Um, <clears throat> rough-legged breeds in the Arctic, in Canada and Alaska and the the upper Arctic. 
the ferruginous hawk is ones we get we think they're coming from uh, idaho and eastern oregon and washington and maybe the central parts of of canada um this bird's tricky because it's got a comma no carpal block no patagial and that's what differs it from the other two we just talked about the red tail has a patagial mark the rough legged has a carpal block the ferruginous has neither ferruginous is more buff and and rust um ferruginous colored um, an orange a gray head a huge gape gape is the mouth um but the gape goes back to the eye huge sear um, and then the legs form a V in flight, and the legs are feathered to the toe. Ooh, dark morph. Super tricky to call dark morph um, ferruginous hawks, but the gape does go back past the eye, robust uh, sear, and then the tail's not marked. A rough legged would have a, a bar. A red tail's hawk, a red tail's hawk tail would be red with a with a fine black subterminal or banded if it was juvenile. A dark morph ferruginous just has pretty much one tone tail. There's that one tone of tail I'm talking about. Sometimes it's it's extremely white. Sometimes it's a bit more off rufous or off off white, um, buffy colored. So there is some variation in the tail, but there's no barring whatsoever. <clears throat> this is a dark morph. It's hard to tell. You don't get your patagial, you don't get your carpal, you don't get your belly band, so you work the tail. The only, you know, Western North American raptor, big bootio, with an unmarked tail is, is the ferruginous hawk. The red tail would have a red tail with a bar, fine subterminal. The, the rough legged would have a, a white tail with a with multiple or single dark um, bar. There's the V, the legs form a V when the bird's in flight. You can't see this side, but the legs definitely form a V. Comma, no carpal, no patagial, relatively, this bird's totally clean, uh, no belly band. Um, the, the chest is, for the most part, uh, buff and tan. Buff is a, another color for a, a off tan. Um, there's, again, some of the, the tones you see in the tail. So it's tricky depending on light. I mean, at given times, it can look white. It can look off-white. If the sun's beaming down on it, you do get some, some rufous or some um, some iron, some orangish hue to it. But overall, the birds, um, brown, gray, and orangish um, with a huge gape, a huge sear. Some, it's the largest North American raptor. It comes, you know, September and stays through March and then heads back up north. Um, there's the unmarked patagial, lacking carpal. Um, sometimes when we see them fly, we say three points of white, white tail base, and white up here at the base of the primaries. But overall, a rufous, not a rufous, a, an orange rust, rust colored, hence ferruginous. A, a grayish um, overtone, and then the tail has a distinct unmarked look to it, but on the, the dorsal side, it is a bit of color on it. Super tricky slide. Um, boy, these are all juveniles. So um, the legs form a V. There are, light does come through um, some of the, the primaries. We call them... Um, uh, windows or panels um, and the bird can be marked up on the chest I'm sorry the belly or it can be totally clean so a little bit of marking here a little bit here um, none here this bird could throw you because somebody would say belly band and it's there but it doesn't have a dark hood and it doesn't have solid patagials and the tail's off for a red tail so whenever something happens like that it's a puzzle okay well Larry you said Red tail hawks have a belly band. Well, there are other birds with belly bands. It's just what else can you get out of the bird that's going to seal your call? What traits? Well, belly band's there, but the tail's wrong for red tail. There's no patagial for red tail. 
and the hood is not dark for red tail. Hence, the um, juvenile ferruginous. For me, I do a lot of silhouettes and shapes, and red tail's wings are shorter from point from tip to tip, and thicker from front to back. Shorter, thicker. Ferruginous's are longer from tip to tip and shorter from front to back. So a kind of a tongue twister, shorter, longer, longer, shorter. So just the silhouette of the birds themselves, red tail hawk, ferruginous hawk. Also the red tails have this kind of like this hand that comes down here in the back and the red and the ferruginous is a nice clean line. So I use silhouettes a lot to help me with my identification. Light bootios in, in a snapshot. Belly band, hood, patagial, red tail, light morph RT. Um, carpal block, carpal block, white tail base with a dark, heavy subterminal. Rough leg hawk. No carpal, comma. There's a marking there, but the patagial is not up to the front of the wing. The patagial mark doesn't reach the front of the wing. No belly band, one tone tail, legs form a V, ferruginous. This is the slide that I have a hard time with because they're all dark morphs. So for the most part, the body and the underwing coverts are dark. So I focus on the brick red tail of a dark morph red tail. The one tone pale tail of a dark morph ferruginous. The overall white tail with one dark subterminal and another smaller bar, also strong carpal coming through. I'm sorry, yeah, strong carpal patches coming through, dark morph rough legged. So if the body's all dark, work the tail. Red tail, ferruginous, rough-legged. I, I can't say how much I work the tail on these birds. We're almost done. Red shoulder hawk, smaller. I just went through the three bigger North American bootios, red tail, ferruginous, rough-legged. Now I'm going into the red shoulder. Smaller um, hawk, way more colorful. Um, of course, there's the red shoulder, overall black and white with the overall orange orange tone to it. I'm going to speed up here because I'm running out of time. Adult bird with a white and black barring on a tail, a juvenile bird. Here's the thing, though. They both have these crescents or windows in the wings. And that's what's important when we look at them compared to broadwing hawks. Um, this bird perched up. Juvenile, adult, juvenile, red-shouldered tail, adult, red-shouldered tail, crescents in the wings. Crescents are windows, these little light panels. Um, in the fist, um, there's the black and white barred tail, the black and white primaries and secondaries on the dorsal, on the ventral, overall orange-looking bird. Um, the juvenile. There's the windows or lights, overall two-tone, brown and brown and tan. Um, and there's the adult tail coming in with the, the black and white, but for the most part, brown and tan, heavily streaked. And here's why we talk about these windows so much on the red shoulder. Because we don't really see it on the broad winged. So we get a few of these in each year. We just had three of them with the Astero last week. It's about the same size as a red shoulder, a bit different flight styles, but here's a juvenile broad wing and here's a juvenile red shoulder. So on the juvenile shoulder, one, two, three, four, five primaries. On the broad wing, one, two, three, four. So four primaries, Five primaries, unique tail barring on the red shoulder, different from the tail barring on the broad wing, and 
The red shoulder has windows or crescents. The broad wing doesn't. Broad wings are tricky. Swanson's hawk. I just threw this in there because we had a couple, uh, one at the Estero last year, one at the General Headlands Hawk Watch a couple years ago. So we do get Swanson's in here. Unique tail barring, different than any other booty oil I've shown you so far. And with the Swanson's, light leading edge, dark trailing edge. That's uncommon to anything I've shown you so far. And then on the Swanson's, long pointy wings, somewhat dihedral compared to the red tails, stout, bold wings. Got to speed up. Silhouettes are everything. Um, if you could find silhouettes and learn silhouettes, you know your falcons from your occipiters, from your budios to your eagles. The golden eagle, um, we've seen a few of these out at the coast. They're they're less and less. They're not there as much as they used to be because the bald eagles are coming back more. But just a massive bird. Here's a red tail hawk for comparison. Um, the adult birds are overall brown with the golden nape. The juvenile birds have white at the base of the primaries and the base of the tail. Adult bird, juvenile bird, golden eagles. Um, massive bird. This is a friend of mine, size size 12 shoe. So if you figure that's size 12, that's that's a foot, about three feet, two and a half feet tall right there, about a seven and a half foot wingspan. It's a massive bird. You don't know it, but its talons are about as big as our hands. The biggest thing we struggle with is a juvenile golden versus a juvenile bald. On a juvenile bald, the white is next to the body white feathers for the most part on a juvenile golden the whites out at the primaries and secondaries and base of the tail adult bald eagle pretty cut and dry white head white tail overall brown body four-year-old bird still working on its some um, white tail this bird tricky, probably a three and a half four-year-old bird because when it probably four years old but when it flew it showed us all the white underlining in here and the tail not white yet. Klamath Basin. Young birds, um, bald eagle. Again, get confused with golden eagle, but the beak's a lot different. And then when the bird shows its underwing linings, the white's next to the body as opposed to being out here at the primaries. Tail's tricky on this one, but it's not as definitive as a golden, a juvenile golden eagle. So... Crosley does neat things. Um, he puts birds against backdrops. And so you can kind of do the math here on a juvenile uh, second year, probably second, third year, third, fourth year, fourth year adult. So he shows all the color morphs of the bald eagles. Not more, sorry, not morphs, the ages of the bald eagles from juvenile to adult. Almost done. This slide helps with, like that one bald eagle I had back there, it had white on its tail, the ju immature, but it wasn't as, as finely um, defined as the, the golden eagle's tail. So adult golden eagle, immature golden eagle, one, two, three years, adult bald eagle, immature, bald eagle that's where people get confused because sometimes there is white on the bald eagle's tail but it's not nice and defined the way the golden eagles is but i wouldn't get sidetracked by the tail because you can just go for the feathers and the wings on a bald eagle the axillaries or wing pits are white juvie bald on a golden eagle the primaries and the base of the secondaries are white and it's a nice defined line on the tail. So I can't elaborate on this slide enough. Don't get confused on the tail, on juvenile and immature, bald and golden. Just work where's the white, next to the body or out on the wing, the base of the primaries. Really close to being done, bear with me. Osprey, um, they catch fish. We love to watch them. They're amazing. Um, I'm always fascinated by their ability to get fish with these incredible fish hooks. They have 
eight hooks instead of one, and they can turn their talon to to hold the fish like this. So it's so there's two talons on each side of the fish, like a rotating thumb back here. Um, they have lots of different wing configurations, outstretched, crooked, or hovering with its fish hooks waiting to grab um, fish. Turkey vulture, couldn't do it without him. Important. Um, the hawk watch we started in 2010. We're going into 2023. Um, some of the research was done in the 80s and 90s with certain people. We did some exploratory stuff in the Jenner Headlands in 2008 and 9. This slide will be up on this program on YouTube. Zach Dotrich passed in 2017. He was a team leader. Ken Magoon passed in 2018. He was a team leader. Monty Curvin was an inspiration for us all. He passed in 2017. We carry on all their work um, in, in memorial and in, in, in their memory. This is the Jenner Hawk Watch team looking out over the coastal expanse. Um, these are some of the programs we run. This is some upcoming dates we have for hawk outings, Wildlands Conservancy, Sonoma Land Trust, Solana Land Trust. Again, reach out to us with questions, hit me up with an email. This program will be posted on YouTube so you can catch all this stuff there. Um, this, again, my contact information is there, my email, my phone number, a dot .com page where we list our outings, a blog spot page where we do write-ups on how the outings went, and then a Facebook group page where you can post pictures of your raptors and you'll get a, an answer as to what they are and, and what's going on. That's it for now. Um, I'll just leave it at that because I think I'm right where I need to be. Yeah, I'm right. I'm pretty much where I need to be. All right. Thank you so much, Larry, for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm for Birds of Prey. And you inspire so many people to get out there. We had over 200 people attend uh, tonight's presentation. And we will be doing a Q&A session in just a moment for those who want to stay on. But if you do have to leave before you go, I just want to say keep engaged with Sonoma Land Trust by following our various social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, and checking out our website, sonomalandtrust.org. And if you want to uh, keep an eye out for more Language of the Land webinars, you can go to sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. And we are a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. And if you like what you heard today, please consider donating because your gift helps support land protection as well as preservation. And if you'd like to make a donation online to Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. And thank you so much. We appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. And so um, if you have some questions for Larry, I see some of you had submitted questions already there's a q a button down at the bottom and uh, go ahead and add those questions in as we uh, finish up tonight's presentation so i'm gonna go ahead and start pitching you some questions larry if you're ready so uh bruce asks uh do exhibitors stay local all year round um he's saying he doesn't think they migrate Sharp shins do. I mean, coopers stay local year round. We have documented nests in Sonoma County, and you can see a cooper's hawk year round. Definitely, their numbers increase um, two or three fold in 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 the winter and the fall. Sharp shins very rarely do we have. I'm I'm in Madrona Audubon in the Breeding Bird Atlas, and we have a couple documented sharp shin nests, but it's very rare. Um, and then there is the caveat that there's a peak when we have our local Cooper's population, and then we have birds moving through south, and then we have birds moving to here to overwinter. So there's that peak threshold in, in, in late September, early October, where we get the trifecta of resident migrant and overwintering coopers 
and that those numbers surge. So we do have coops year round, but not as much as we do overwintering. And then we have the isolated sharp shins. I've seen one sharp shin in June my whole life. All right. Uh, Bonnie has a question. How does the size of the Kestrel compare to a J? It's similar, you know, that the Kess, um, it's, 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 it's like inches, an inch or two either way. I'm bigger. But I mean, the scrub, again, J, scrub J, stellar J, um, similar. I mean, also the, the J is a bit more slender and, 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 and the, the Kestrel is a bit more bulky. But honestly, I always refer to scientific data. So the best answer would be to look in a bird guide and look at the size comparison of a of a American Kestrel to whatever J you want to compare it to. I would defer to they're both similarly sized, but the Kestrel is a bit more uh, robust and 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 I'd say about an inch bigger, uh, tall and link, wing length as a guess. But I would always defer to a scientific document like a bird guide. Great. And uh, Jerry has a question about falconry. I'm not sure how much you know about falconry, but he's uh, asking if the kestrels used in falconry in other parts of the world are larger than American kestrels. Yeah, you know, there's there's a Eurasian kestrel and there's kestrels throughout the continents. And I'm sure the size difference, there's size differences, differences within those kestrel species. I'm familiar with uh, North American kestrel, the American kestrel. Um, and I actually handled them a couple of times at bird rescue, not as a falcon falconry person, but they're pretty high strung. <laughs> they're fun. But um, in regards to the question, there's for sure a size difference in kestrels worldwide. The successes of falconry as an asset, I'm not sure, but there is a, a, a book. Um, it's the world guide to birds of prey. And it shows every bird of prey in the world. And that would be a great resource to, to look through to see the, the weight. And when we say size, there's three things. The, the distance from wingtip to wingtip, the height of the bird from head to tail, and then the, the grams, the how, how, how dense, how heavy the bird is. So when we talk size, there's a lot of variables. That's why kind of the Kestrel J question was interesting because, you know, one could be taller than the other, but the other could have a longer wingspan. For sure, the kestrel is heavier. All right. Uh, Melinda's asking if you've seen any significant changes in the numbers of birds of prey over the decade that you've been monitoring. I, I go two year, I go two or three decades. Um, gosh, the American kestrel decline is is huge. Petaluma Hill Road. Um, we used to ride bikes down along there and we'd see you know 20 24 birds along from Santa Rosa Avenue down to uh to Pen Pengrove or Pengrove to uh yeah Pengrove now I see six or eight so I see the declining American kestrel and then white-tailed kites are weird like sometimes we won't get any and the next year we'll have a lot mm. and of course the northern harrier we're not seeing as many northern harriers um so for me right off the bat what I notice is less kestrels and less harriers. Um, one thing also that kind of bums me out is golden eagles along the coast. We would get, you know, six, eight, 12 in a survey and West Northwest Marin, Southwest Sonoma County in the nineties. Now we, we, we get one or two, mm -hmm. but we think that's because the bald eagles have reclaimed a lot of their traditional territory and pushed the eagles inland. The eagles just had it made. The Goldens had it made because the Eagles, the balls weren't around. But just recap, I'm seeing more exhibitors. So maybe the bird feeder thing is a, you know, we feed a lot of birds and then feeding birds, we feed yeah. predators. So um, a lot of the species have stayed the same. But one thing, not going way off on a tangent, burrowing owl. I've seen less burrowing owls, but for sure, less kesses and less harriers. All right. And uh, Linda has a similar question. She's thinking about the increase in bird extinctions 
and she's wondering if you what the prediction for the survival of birds of prey is and you know they're pretty opportunistic like the red tail hawk is there's so many red tails because they do so good at everything mm -hmm. um mammals birds rodents insects um i i have a strong i'm i don't know how to say it I'm pretty demoralized by the monoculture of pesticides and killing all the insects and the insects are what's important to the, 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 the prey, the prey species and the predators. So like the, the little small uh, reptiles and mammals that eat the insects that the birds of prey eat those mammals and, and reptiles. And then again, just the sheer birds of prey that eat insects, uh, swans and socks, kestrels, um, kites. I mean, the there's my big concern is pesticides and and the demise of insects. Hence, losing pollen pollen pollinization of of stuff, and then also losing insects, which are a crucial factor in small birds, mammals, and rodents, which feed the raptors. And then let alone just small birds and part of the Autobahn, we monitor warblers and sparrows and the passerines and songbirds. And there's just been a gentle decline of these species over the last couple of decades. And I think personally, it goes hand in hand with big money, big farming, big government and and buying out politicians. And I'm sorry I said that I'll, I'll own that since I'm on a public forum. <laughs> Well, Larry, we got a lot of thanks and appreciation for you in the chat and for the presentation. Uh, Claudia says, thanks for a terrific and informative presentation. She has a question. Uh, how do you spell patagial? You know, it's 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 weird because the patagio, patagium, patagial, and Ann Prentice helped me one time. There's patagios one patagio patagios one one there's one there's two and there's a plural but p-a-t-a-g-i-a-l i think but i mean if you look it up on a raptor um field mark or raptor identific identification document it's, it's there um i'm not sure to tell you the truth off the top of my head we put you There's a spot. patagium, the patagium, <laughs> patagia, and patagial, and it has to do with one or two, and I always get it mixed up, just blatantly honest. All right, question from Gina, would a Merlin chase a flicker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they love them. <laughs> well, we, me and Corby were out on a, a hike last week, and we had a Cooper's hawk go after a quail, and then after the Coopers gave up on the quail, and Merlin went for the quail. And we initially thought it was a flicker because the flicker had been calling all, all day, but then the flight wasn't right for a flicker and we determined it was a, a quail. And that's, I mean, sadly, I like flickers, but um, yeah, Merlin and Coopers, they like to go after flickers. Yeah. I... And they're easy to find because they're always making noise. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a lot of flicker feathers on the ground where I assume uh, maybe a exhibitor took them out. Well, um, that's all the questions from folks in online here. Unless you want to answer or uh, ask some questions, please enter them in the Q&A. But I have one for you, Larry. I'm wondering, um, you know, we've got the Jenner headlands, great spot to go out and see uh, these birds of prey migrating. But how far east inland does the Pacific Flyway go for these birds of prey? And where might be some some good. Well, the spots. Pacific Flyway is is notoriously along the 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 Sacramento uh, inland delta system that used to stretch. So you look at those old maps before we settled every we settled before we changed everything. Hmm. Um, that delta would stretch, you know, almost the whole basin. Like there's that one town down down near fresno or somewhere that the lake just appeared out of nowhere this year and re and reclaimed itself it was a lake that had had been dormant for a long time but so much runoff came the lake is back that whole sacramento valley the inland the inland um of california the breadbasket was was marsh and 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 um and tidal not tidal but uh was it was it was marshland the pacific flyway in my mind 
is hemmed in by the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So, you know, of course, the Pacific Flyway comes down through the Central Valley, but we're looking at the coastal section that we look at. So back to your question, how far inland, you know, would you see birds migrating? There's a hawk watch at Mount, at Mount Diablo. Um, so, you know, as long as the, it, there's wind and there's mountain ranges to provide an up updraft or or a, a thermal or a updraft, they'll fly along that mountain range to to get from north to south. Um, so I would just say up up into the Sierra Nevada. Right? Is any here? Look at this. Anybody still here? I saved this for you guys. This is a dilute plumage uh, red tail hawk. This is really what me and my my folks do is we seek out the rare um leucistic and dilute plumage birds and we've had about a dozen over the last two decades so this is a dilute plumage red tail hawk um in jenner about four or five years ago that's beautiful that's a special prize for those who who stayed this late yep we got 99 people still on so <laughs> congratulations to them well, thank you so much, Larry, for a great presentation. Thank you, Mariana, for um, helping to translate. And uh, we hope to see uh, some of you folks who attended out on the land with your eyes on the sky. So thanks to all and have a Yeah, wonderful... thank you all. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody who was a part of it, who helped make it happen, Mariana and Gorby and, and Ingrid and Sonoma Land Trust. And thanks more than anything to um, the land trusts and the people who work to save the land to acquire, to reestablish, acquire, um, preserve, and then open to the public. Cause that's the key is it's one thing to save it and provide habitat, but it's a whole nother thing to get the public out there and showcase it. Because once people get inspired by nature, it's really inspires them as individuals. It saved my life. Um, a long time ago, I was looking for something, a direction and, Birds of Prey was that direction. And it pretty much brought me out of a, a bad time and it's been good ever since. Well, thank you, Larry, for sharing that. And uh, I look forward to uh, hiking with you on Sunday. All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening.